This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, you guys, let's go ahead and get started. So this morning, uh, we have a visiting speaker. This is Dr. Uh, Vadla Moody from the anesthesia department. So she's involved with cardiac anesthesia, and in particular, a lot of work with our structural cases. So we'll let her get started. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks for your time and attention. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. As you guys know, we collaborate quite a bit with you all, and I think that's only going to continue to increase. RM and I have had a lot of quality time in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things to talk about today. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the who and the what. You know, what is a cardiac anesthesiologist? What do we do? I think that anesthesiology still tends to be the one of the dark horse specialties out there. People don't really seem to know what we do, and people don't really seem to know why we're there. Um, but I think we do add a lot of value to things. Um, and then we'll talk a lot, spend the bulk of the time talking about cardiopulmonary bypass. I think that's still is very nebulous to people who are not involved in that. Um, it just seems like a kind of a black box of we go on bypass and we come off bypass and, and then the patient arrives in the ICU. But obviously there's a lot of things that go into preparing the patients and a lot of complications that can occur. So who are the cardiac anesthesiologists? Well, we're a 14 division faculty, excuse me, 14 faculty division. We train six adult cardiac, cardiothoracic anesthesiology fellows a year. So it's a pretty big group, um, one of the biggest fellowships in the country. All of our faculty are fellowship trained, and all of us are advanced perioperative TE certified. I would have a picture of us, but it's from several years ago, and a lot of the people don't work here anymore, so didn't want to tease you with that. Um, well, what do we do? So we provide perioperative care for patients who are having cardiac and thoracic surgery, so that's a whole gamut of things. Obviously, today is really going to be focusing on cardiac surgery, but do a tremendous amount of lung operations here, tumors, esophagectomies. Um, lung transplants are a big part of our practice, and that's going to continue to grow. Um, we do a tremendous amount of cardiology procedures as well, and that volume is only going to increase. I, just as a background, I did my med school and training here, so I was resident from 2006 to 2010 and then did fellowship right afterwards, and that was when we were first starting to do TAVR. So when I was a resident 2007-8 doing my first cardiac anesthesia rotations, that was our very first TAVRs. Now we're, you know, 2,500, 3,000 patients go home the next day versus when I was a resident doing the first few TAVRs, you know, they would get full invasive cardiac lines, they would be done under general anesthesia in the hybrid room downstairs and all go to the ICU for probably several days to manage all the complications that occur. So it's just in, you know, 10, 12 years to see that tremendous amount of development is pretty amazing to see. Um, we also will take care of high-risk patients for non-cardiac surgery, and especially that really falls under the congenital patients. You know, and our policy at Emory Healthcare is any patient with one ventricle is cared for by a cardiac anesthesiologist, and a lot of that does tend to happen at this campus just because we obviously have the congenital cardiology service here so they can continue to um, see the patients pre- and post-op. So what are we doing? Um, a lot of what we do is um, very hands-on, so a lot of invasive monitors. Every cardiac surgical patient here, for the most part, will get large IVs, A-line, um, central line with a PA catheter. There's controversy about PA catheters in cardiac surgery. That's probably been a discussion for the last 20, 30 years. Our surgeons at Emory tend to be very dependent on cardiac, on, excuse me, on PA catheter um, information and data. So the majority of our patients will receive PA catheters to help guide therapy in and during the surgery as well as post-op. We perform TEs to help diagnose, and I, a lot of times that's confirming what has already been diagnosed by our cardiology colleagues, and sometimes we'll have a lot of surprise findings, and we'll also be guiding our surgical colleagues when they make their decision making. We induce and maintain general anesthesia during these procedures. By and large, the majority of our procedures are going to be done using general anesthesia. We will do some alternative techniques, and especially that comes into play when we're doing patients in the, in the cath labs and the EP labs, but in general, major cardiac surgery is still going to be general anesthesia. We will wean cardiopulmonary bypass. If the patient has mechanical support, we will help to wean that. And if the patient needs advanced support, something as simple as an intraortic balloon pump all the way up to, to VA ECMO, we'll manage that advanced circulatory support and other types of support that happen. So switching base now to talk a little bit about cardiopulmonary bypass. Why do we need cardiopulmonary bypass? Well, really, it um, helps to give the surgeons an ideal operating field. So it's a bloodless field, and it's a stable surgical field because the heart is, for the most part, arrested and still. It's decompressed, so they can manipulate the heart. They can manipulate the great vessels. Um, one thing that you'll commonly see, especially for cabbage, is when we're doing off-pump cabbage, which we can talk a little bit about that, but that's not really the scope of this. But 
when everyone is getting ready to do the posterior descending artery um, graft, you know, everyone kind of girds their loins a little bit because it's obviously on the back of the heart. There's a tremendous amount of manipulation that occurs, a lot of arrhythmias, decreased preload, significant hemodynamic instability that can occur. And obviously all of that is negated when you're going on cardiopulmonary bypass. So gold standard still remains cardiopulmonary bypass for something as simple as a coronary revascularization. There's been a lot of data and a lot of looking into the differences between on-pump and off-pump cabbage, and the data really doesn't support off-pump cabbage. So if you've followed our surgeons to see what they've done in the last few years, a few years ago we were doing tremendous amounts of off-pump cabbage, especially led by John Puskis, um, who was a pioneer in off-pump cabbage. But the data, again, really doesn't support it, so a lot of our surgeons have kind of changed their thoughts and are mostly going back to on-pump cabbage. Um, but what the purpose of cardiopulmonary bypass, again, besides the operating conditions, it circulates the blood. Um, it lets us have very easy manipulation of temperature to control the temperature on cardiopulmonary bypass, and it enables gas exchange, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. So the indications for CPB, so cabbage is probably one of the most common indications. That's really the, um, one of the original procedures that was done using cardiopulmonary bypass but lots of other open chamber procedures. So anytime you have to open the heart to get to something inside the heart, obviously you have to be able to have an arrested still feel to do that, or else the patient will entrain massive amounts of room air and um, quickly have unstable hemodynamics. So anytime we're doing a valve procedure repair or replacement, any aortic surgery, anytime a patient's getting a ventricular assist device or a heart transplant, those are all gonna be done on cardiopulmonary bypass. We will do some lung transplants utilizing cardiopulmonary bypass just for aid in oxygenation, ventilation, and hemodynamic stability. The um, thoracic surgeons unfortunately find the heart is in the way when they're trying to put new lungs in, so they can beat up the heart quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure if they trend to pronins after a lung transplant, but I think they shouldn't because I think they would auto always be high, and these patients almost never have coronary disease or else they wouldn't be a candidate for a lung transplant, but you know, the, it's just in the way for them. They're trying to get the lungs in. So this is a very, very, very basic schematic. I'm gonna have a much busier slide shortly, but starting off here at the patient, we use a venous cannula to drain um, from a venous source from the patient to the venous reservoir. Then we go through the main pump, and from there the pump goes to a couple of things which are very much close in line. The gas exchange, which is a membrane oxygenator um, that's used to add CO, excuse me, to add oxygen and remove CO2. Again, we have a temperature controller with a heater cooler exchanger. We do continue to anesthetize the patients. We have an anesthetic vaporizer that's in line in the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. Then blood is returned from all of the reservoir and all of these things through the arterial cannula back to the patient. So we're gonna break these down and talk about each one in detail. So that's a very simplistic, that is the most basic bypass circuit that you can have. We almost never have a very basic circuit like that. And so a lot of the components that go into cardiopulmonary bypass, I think the most important one here is a perfusionist. So we have a master's level trained person who is, their job is to run the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. They work under the direction of one of the physicians in the room, so it's usually a combination of the anesthesiology attending and the cardiac surgery attending, but they take direction from us when they're managing things. So anything that they're doing in terms of adding medications, deciding whether to transfuse blood always is under the direction of one of the physicians. So again, the basic components of cardiopulmonary bypass, so we always have to obviously start with the patient, have a venous cannula. The venous cannula drains from the patient mostly by using gravity. So if you'll ever come down to the operating room, you'll notice that the cardiopulmonary bypass machine sits about a foot or two below the level of the patient. So we drain mostly by gravity. Sometimes we'll put a small amount of suction on that, that cannula to help drain the patient. Um, the, Cardiopulmonary bypass circuit functions based on the venous return. So if your venous return is inadequate because your venous cannula is too small or it's malpositioned or you are very hypovolemic because the surgeons have lost a lot of blood into the field and it's not going into the bypass circuit, then automatically you're gonna be considered off cardiopulmonary bypass because if there's not enough volume to return back to the patient, then you're just gonna be pumping a circuit full of air or crystalloid and obviously that is gonna be very, um, very much not something we like to do. You have to have an arterial cannula. There's gonna be, as I said, an oxygenator. Sometimes the, the names are used very interchangeably. Oxygenator, gas exchanger, those you can really think of that as being the same thing. We'll have a couple of different types of pumps and we'll talk about the differences between those two and why that's important. We have the heater cooler exchanger, which is going to be regulating the temperature on cardiopulmonary bypass. 
the anesthetic source. So again, those are kind of the basic things. And then we usually will add a couple of things for most procedures that we will utilize cardiopulmonary bypass, cardioplegia system, cardiotomy suction, and a vent to help decompress the heart. So this is a much busier slide, but this is probably what most of our cardiopulmonary bypass circuits look like in the operating room. So you can see here, you've got your heart. Um, you've got lots of different arrows. Don't get too bogged down in this. I can definitely send you these slides if you'd like to take a peek at them um, later at your own time. But lots of different things here. So again, here's the heart. Here's your venous reservoir, oxygenator here, heater cooler exchanger. This is your big systemic pump. And then you have these other smaller pumps. These are called um, cardiotomy suction, or you'll hear the surgeons call them the pump suckers. Um, we have lots of filters because obviously we want to be able to catch any debris, and especially since we're returning from in the arterial line directly back to the central circulation, we want to be able to ensure that there's no air, as minimal air as possible, and obviously uh, taking out any debris because we worry about neurologic complications. So down here is your anesthetic vaporizer. Can't see the perfusionist, but they're somewhere over here. And this is obviously spread out, so it's a much more compact machine. And sometimes those of you who've um, helped us out during structural heart cases, you'll see if we have to go on cardiopulmonary bypass in the cath lab, they'll be able to wheel the machine up and bring it up to the cath lab if necessary. So starting off with some of the very basic things, obviously you can't go on cardiopulmonary bypass if you don't have venous access to be able to do that. So at the very minimal, you have to have at least one venous cannula and one arterial cannula. As long as you have a V and an A source, you can go on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, sometimes if we're doing a high-risk multi-redo patient, a lot of our congenital patients fall into this category where this is their fifth, sixth, seventh, sometimes cardiac surgical procedure the surgeons will refer to their chest as very hostile. And that's true because everything is adhesed down. Sometimes they'll have a pectus defect, especially that makes it more challenging. And getting through that sternum again, taking down those dense adhesions to get actually to the heart is very dangerous. And we could injure a mediastinal structure and have massive blood loss before we're able to reopen fully and gain access for cardiopulmonary bypass. So a lot of times the surgeons will cannulate peripherally femoral arterial, femoral venous, go on cardiopulmonary bypass to decompress the heart and also have the venous system somewhat protected and then open the chest. So as I said, it, you have to have a minimum of one V, one A, and that can be accomplished in multiple different ways. You can have full peripheral cannulation, meaning femoral arterial, femoral venous, or femoral venous, right axillary artery, um, or you can have full central. So the most common one, right atrial appendage, ascending aorta, that's probably what we use in the majority of our cardiopulmonary bypass procedures for cabbages, simple valves, cabbage valves, et cetera. Um, but obviously you could, depending on your patient condition, you know, at Emory we tend to do a lot of um, redo operations, tend to have a high complexity in our patient population, so we often have to be very creative when we're thinking about cannulation. And those of you who have cared for Dr. Um, Brad Leschnauer's patients, either pre or post-op, know that his patients tend to be very complex vascular anatomy. And what we've started doing lately is when he's doing these high-risk redos and patients who've had prior aortic surgery, They've had their right axillary artery utilized for cardiopulmonary bypass in the past. We usually will not redo that anastomosis because you can cause ischemia to the right arm down the stream later on. So what he'll do is cannulate directly their right carotid artery, and obviously he'll have to extend his incision way up high. So he, we just did that on Monday. So just a couple of pictures here. So this is a very standard aortic cannula. You can see it's really just this very small tip at the end. It's wire reinforced. Um, everything is color coded in the operating room because we tend to be very simple. And when you have a, you know, 50 different lines, it's very easy to keep things color coded. So you'll notice the arterial cannula has a red hash mark on it. The venous cannula has blue lines on it. Um, everything is color coded for us. So we like to keep it simple like that. So this is a standard aortic cannula, a standard um, two-stage venous cannula, and we'll have a couple of pictures of what that looks like in a second. So this is some uh, very basic venous cannulation. This is what we do for probably the majority of our cases. So on the left here, you'll see what we call a two-stage cannula entering the right atrial appendage. And I, we call it two-stage because there's two areas for venous return. So here directly from the IVC, you can see the fenestrations in the cannula and here in the right atrial appendage directly. So you have two different locations for venous return to be drained back to the heart. Um, and that contrasts over here on the, the right side with bicaval cannulation. So we're directly, directly cannulating both the SVC and the IVC with a kind of a J-tipped cannula. The differences between these two really depends on the surgical procedure. So anytime we are doing something that is gonna to need to involve the right atrium, so if we're operating on the right side of heart valves, we're doing a tricuspid valve intervention or a heart transplant, something like that, where we have to have 
the right atrium exposed to us, then we're going to be using bicable cannulation. So for instance, yesterday at Midtown with Robert Guyton, we did a um, planned mitral valve intervention for a mitral valve um, P1 prolapse, but I unfortunately discovered that the patient also had moderate TR with a dilated tricuspid annula, so he changed his plan to bicaval cannulation so he could also intervene on the tricuspid valve. So a little bit more of the components. So in thinking about gas exchange, so we use a membrane oxygenator. Um, the reason that that's important, it's permeable to gas, but not permeable <laughs> to blood. So you don't have to worry about um, excessive blood loss related to the oxygenator. But that provides oxygen to the patient. So it's basically the function of the lungs in the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. It also will remove CO2. So this is similar to the membrane oxygenator that's used if you guys have taken care of any patients on VA ECMO. Um, and so the way that we can adjust this is we can obviously increase or decrease the FiO2 um, that's being bled into the circuit, and we can increase or decrease the sweep. So the rate of sweep is going to be what controls how much CO2 is removed from the patient. So we'll be checking arterial blood gases that the perfusionist will run about every 30 minutes, sometimes more frequently on cardiopulmonary bypass. And what we're looking for is honestly normal parameters. So we don't expect to see a pH of 7.1 on cardiopulmonary bypass. If that's related to a metabolic acidosis, we'll try to correct that. If it's related to a respiratory acidosis because the sweep is too low, we'll have the perfusionist increase the sweep to exchange more CO2 so that we can have more normal pH. And then we have the heater cooler exchanger. Again, that's used for temperature control. For, because cardiopulmonary bypass is very much not physiologic, it's continuous flow, we will usually utilize systemic hypothermia for major organ protection on cardiopulmonary bypass. The organ systems that I always worry about the most are the ones that unfortunately rely on autoregulation. So the brain, the heart, the kidneys are the ones that we really worry about the most. And you know, we can do things for the kidneys to try to help them. We can't really do much for the brain if there's severe neurologic injury. That's unfortunately, if it's a perfect surgical operation, that's still going to be a major morbidity or mortality that occurs. So really, we're con concentrating on the brain and the heart the most. So talking a little bit about the different types of pumps. So for the main pump, which going back to this picture here, is this guy right there. That's your main pump. That is a centrifugal pump. Um, and so the reason that's important compared to these cardiotomy suckers or pump suckers, these guys right here, those are roller pumps. And so that's going to be much more trauma to the blood because of the way the pump suction. So as you can imagine, the rollers, there's a little kind of Thing that rolls the blood through. So just there's much more mechanical stress and trauma to the blood. So you have much more hemolysis, much more platelet dysfunction associated with that. But those are going to be a much smaller volume because the surgeons will use that as opposed to a Yankauer before we go on cardiopulmonary bypass. They'll use those specific cardiotomy suckers to, once we're fully heparinized, get blood from the field that's not contained by the cannulas that are going directly to the bypass circuit to drain blood back to the, um, to the bypass circuit so that we're able to maintain as much of the patient's blood volume as possible. But the main pump that's utilized to pump the amount of blood flow that we need to maintain full flow cardiopulmonary bypass is a centrifugal pump. So that's going to be much less trauma and able to conserve as much of our patient's blood volume and normal blood volume as possible. You know, one of the major complications after cardiac surgery is significant coagulopathy that's related to that and all of the downstream um, sequelae of needing a significant resuscitation that we all are aware of, you know, in terms of um, transfusion reactions, immune responses, et cetera. So significant lung injury can certainly occur. So anything that we can do in the operating room to try to minimize the hemodilution that's associated with going on cardiopulmonary bypass, damage to your normal blood volume, your normal platelet function, et cetera, is um, as, as, as important as what we can do. Um, we know that um, even just giving a one or two units of blood is associated with less quality and less morbidity, uh, excuse me, more morbidity. And that's something that's very closely tracked by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons when they're ranking the quality of cardiac surgical care. You may have heard this, but there's one to three star programs. And something as seems as innocuous as giving one unit of blood to a patient who's had a cabbage and otherwise has had a very uncomplicated post-op course, that is considered not quality care because you know, with gold standard cardiac surgery, why has a patient required blood? And so that goes back to the pre-op process where you guys are very heavily involved in that. And so we'll oftentimes, you'll see the surgeons will try to delay patients or maybe push for them to get blood preoperatively because even though it seems like semantics, that doesn't count. So the clock starts honestly when they get to the operating room. So if they get blood in the OR or post-op up to day 30, that unfortunately counts as them receiving a blood transfusion when they should not expect to receive it. But if they receive it pre-op day one, that doesn't count. So sometimes you might be questioning why they're doing that. Well, that's why. <laughs> 
So the anesthetic source, so as I said, there's an inhaled vaporizer um, for our inhaled anesthetic agents. That's this guy right here. We will continue to anesthetize the patients. The reason that it's on the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit and it's not continued from the anesthetic machine that we use in the operating room is because when we're on cardiopulmonary bypass, obviously we're not ventilating the lungs, so the lungs are turned off. So we have no way to get the patient's medication into their lungs so that it can be taken up into the brain and continue to anesthetize them. Um, it's important to continue to anesthetize patients. When we were originally looking at cardiopulmonary bypass about 50, 60 years ago, there was a lot of um, misconceptions about what types of anesthetics you needed on cardiopulmonary bypass. And so the majority of patients received narcotic only. So something like fentanyl or morphine only. And there was a significant amount of awareness under anesthesia on cardiopulmonary bypass. So patients were somewhat awake, not fully awake, but they were able to know that they weren't fully anesthetized. And obviously that can lead to significant amounts of um, trauma related to that. So now we know that patients continue to need full levels of anesthetic um, while on cardiopulmonary bypass. Even when you're significantly hypothermic, you know, the number to think about is each degree below about 36, 37 degrees, it will decrease your cerebral metabolic rate about 7%. So when you're doing something with moderate to deep hypothermia, you know, your brain requirements of oxygen are still very, very low, but that doesn't mean that we can reduce our anesthetic as well. Um, if you do have a patient that has issues that make a contraindication to an inhaled anesthetic technique, so the one that we think about most commonly and one of our big things in anesthesia, malignant hyperthermia, tends to be somewhat rare. We don't necessarily see it very frequently, but if we do know about it ahead of time, obviously it's a contraindication to use an inhaled anesthetic in those patients, and they will need to use a total intravenous anesthetic. So things that you guys have seen in the CCU and the ICU, think something like propofol to maintain um, a deep level of general anesthesia. So we will induce a diastolic arrest using cardioplegia solution. Um, obviously, the reason that we do that has been we're putting a cross clamp on the heart. It's on the very proximal ascending aorta. So it's really just distal to the, um, you know, maybe a few centimeters distal to, the, to take off of the coronary arteries. So when you're putting a cross clamp on that high, you have a tremendous increase in afterload. Obviously, that's going to be a huge stress on the LV. And if you don't arrest the heart pretty quickly after you place a cross clamp, you're going to have tremendous amount of myocardial injury. So we induce diastolic arrest. Um, we do this with a combination of things, but for the most part, it's gonna be high potassium solution. We'll also put ice in the chest just for systemic, uh, for local hypothermia, and then we'll also use a heater cooler exchanger to induce systemic hypothermia. Um, but we'll be, we'll be monitoring that continuously when the patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass with the cross clamp on. We want the heart to be continuous, continuously arrested. So you'll notice if you ever come down to the operating rooms, which I welcome all of you to do that, um, we'll be standing there at the head of the bed looking to make sure the heart is quiet. We'll be looking at our EKG. If we start to see some signs of activity, then we'll be letting, talking to the surgeons, talking to the perfusionists, and they'll be redosing cardioplegia solution to maintain that arrest. And then looking at venting the heart. So lots of different ways to vent the heart, which are all outlined in this picture, but the purpose of the LV vent is to decompress the ventricle because we want to avoid a distension injury. You know, just as um, patients v, you know, who are fibrillating or who are in VTAC or just a sinus rhythm on cardiopulmonary by bypass, that's a huge oxygen demand supply imbalance. So one of the main things that we're trying to maintain is appropriate oxygen supply demand. When you have a cross clamp on your own cardiopulmonary bypass, your oxygen supply is basically zero. So if your heart is fibrillating, if your heart is distended, that's a huge amount of wall tension. That's going to be a tremendous increase in oxygen demand, which we want to avoid. So the heart should always be decompressed as much as possible when you're on cardiopulmonary bypass. The way that we can look at that, obviously we can use our echo to look at that. We can look across the field and see, does the heart look big? We're looking at a monitor. Does the CVP look high? Is the PA pressure high? All of those things are um, going to be causes of of discussion in the, in the operating room. So lots of ways that we can vent the heart. The most common is going to be number C, and we'll talk about each one. So one way that we can vent is by putting a cannula in the ascending aorta, and that will just go sometimes across the aortic valve or just sometimes just suck blood around and just so you can decompress the LV. A very old-fashioned way, which we don't really do anymore, is directly cannulating the LV apex with a small cannula to decompress the heart. You know, I think in um, cardiac surgery, we try to avoid putting holes in things that we wouldn't necessarily put holes in. So in the LV apex is one of those places that if you don't have to mess with it, you just should, should not mess with it. Most common approach to LV venting is from a pulmonary vein. So you can see here they're using one of the right pulmonary veins to access the heart. 
we'll usually go across the mitral valve to help decompress the heart there. And less commonly, we'll use a pulmonary artery to help decompress the heart. Sometimes they'll have to do multiple of these. If you have a patient who has, um, maybe if they have mitral stenosis, we can't get across the mitral valve to get to the LV, just depending on their patient, their anatomy and their specific conditions. But always want to be thinking about decompressing the heart, especially if you have a patient with significant aortic insufficiency. So as we talked about here, when we give cardioplegia, we're looking for a diastolic arrest. So if you have a patient who has an incompetent aortic valve in diastole, you're gonna have all of that flow coming from your aortic cannula that's gonna go backwards across that incompetent orifice and, de and distend the LV, and that's gonna potentially cause distension injury. Um, it's very much not subtle. You'll see that very quickly on echo across the field. Your PAs will be in the mid-20s to 30s. We expect the mean PA to be in the single digits while on cardiopulmonary bypass because the entire heart should be decompressed. So if we start to see that, the surgeons should already know to decompress the heart, but that's something that we can nudge them into doing if they've maybe um, forgotten that or think that they're going to be able to get away without venting the heart. So I want to spend the next little few minutes to talk about anticoagulation on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, and if you have some extra time, you know, I know you guys don't have so much free time with all your clinical work, but if you want to do some good reading, so this um, Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the SCA, and the um, American Society of Extracorporeal Technology came out with some practice guidelines last year, and I'm happy to send this to everybody, um, really focusing on what are the guidelines for anticoagulation on cardiopulmonary bypass. So most places will usually use the same um, techniques, the same um, indications and same guidelines to help manage anticoagulation, but it's nice to have it actually in one document. And they also talk about a lot of alternative issues or when you have issues with heparin resistance or heparin allergies. But gold standard, and that's what we use for every single patient unless there's a reason not to, is heparin with ACT monitoring. You know, I know all of you use this obviously when you're doing your procedures, but heparin is, you know, a very standardized anticoagulant. We know how it works. Even though it needs a cofactor, it's very reliable. We can monitor it very reliably with ACT and we can reverse it. So it has kind of all of the things that you're looking for in an ideal anticoagulant, especially since it has a standardized reversal agent. What causes um, cardiac anesthesiologists a fair amount of angst, so you'll always see us um, get very nervous, not maybe nervous, but it's, it's a higher level of attention that has to be paid anytime a patient has heparin listed as an allergy on their, um, on their medical record if they're presenting for cardiac surgery. That's one of those things we especially will tell our trainees when they're seeing the inpatients the day before cardiac surgery. If that's something that they note, they need to discuss it with one of the attendings immediately. A lot of times the surgeons will call us if they know that there's a patient who has a documented heparin allergy. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do that still involves us using heparin, but it involves quite a bit of workup, and that's where you guys potentially come in. So. Looking at heparin, our institutional guidelines, and um, some of this will depend on where you are, but in general, it's these numbers, and if they're, if it's nice, especially for our new trainees who are new to the cardiac service, that the numbers are the same. So heparin is 400 units per kilo for cardiopulmonary bypass. Our ACT goal is above 400 seconds. Um, we always will get a baseline ACT to see where the patient is starting. So at the beginning of the procedure, we'll give our perfusionist an ACT um, at baseline so we can see, usually just depending on what the patient is, you know, between about 85 and 150. They may have been on heparin beforehand for an acute coronary syndrome, but generally that's where we are, and we expect it to go up appropriately. If we do have patients with heparin resistance, probably the most common one that we'll see, and you guys obviously see this as you manage a lot of heparin drips, is going to be antithrombin deficiency. Um, we used to manage that with usually giving uh, first our first line therapy is to give additional heparin to try to overcome that. Um, if that's not adequate, then we would replenish the antithrombin. We use antithrombin concentrate now since that's available, and it's a much less volume load to the heart, especially with our patients with diastolic dysfunction, compared to giving somebody a tremendous amount of FFP to, to, do, to accomplish the same thing. So again, when we have a patient with an heparin allergy, I think it's important really to define what the allergy is. Um, it's extremely rare to have a non-immune-mediated heparin allergy. So a patient who says that, oh, some person told me that I can't get heparin because some of the stuff that it's mixed in. That's extremely rare. Obviously, the best thing to do for that patient, if the patient can wait, really get allergy testing because that is extremely rare. Um, but patients, unfortunately, as you know, come and tell you things because somebody else told them or they you know, we're sick one time and they're blaming it on drug X or, you know, that little blue pill made me really sick. Well, can't you look it up in your book? No. They ask us that too, so if it makes you feel better. Um, so defining that allergy as much as possible. 
And if there's a suspicion for HIT, it's really not enough to do the ELISA. We really need a confirmatory test because the ELISA, as you guys know, can pick up a lot of those um, antibodies that are not immunogenic. So with, yes, the ELISA may be positive, but those may not be the, the um, antigen antibody complexes that are really um, um, indicated or that will cause HIT to happen. So try to send a confirmatory test as much as possible. We understand that it's a send out, but the earliest that can be sent out, if the patient can wait, can be delayed even a few days, then that's always gonna be best. So managing patients who do have a diagnosis or a history of HIT, I think it's important to talk about the timeline of what that means. So acute HIT is somebody who is really in the acute phase. They have both thrombocytopenia, they're HIT antibody positive. Those are obviously the sick patients who are going to be on alternative anticoagulants until they come out of the acute phase. Patients with subacute HIT, they are still antibody positive, but their platelet count has recovered, and hopefully the acute phase of all the complications associated with HIT are much better as well. And then patients with a history of HIT, so these patients have a normal platelet count and their antibody level is negative, so their ELISA is negative. So this is usually patients who are probably six months to a year out. You can typically expect your HIT antibody levels to really dissipate after about 90 days. So after that point, most patients will not have um, positive HIT antibodies. So how do we manage these patients if they're presenting for elective surgery? Well, it's usually very simple to think about those patients. So if they have acute HIT, you know, if it's truly elective, the answer is wait. You know, always wait because we always want to be able to use heparin because it's not just the use of heparin that's the issue. Is that these patients, if you look at the morbidity and mortality of them, have much more significant complications if you're operating on them in an acute HIT event. They're going to have all the thrombosis complications, all the thrombotic complications, especially if you think about doing a cabbage. You know, these tiny vein grafts that we're using, the lemas, you know, they're very, very small vessels. And if you have a th small thrombotic complication, then we're going to be calling you guys in the middle of the night to come do an intervention and see what we can do. And oh, well, the vein is completely thrombosed and the patient has a huge MI, and then you could have a lot of untoward complications related to that. So there's really no data to s support if it's truly elective. If the patient can wait, the answer is always to wait. If it's subacute HIT, so the patient th uh, platelet count has re has risen appropriately, but they're still HIT antibody positive. Again, wait. Just give them time. Usually, as I said, within 30, excuse me, 90 days, three months, their antibodies will be negative, and you can go ahead and proceed. And if they have the history of HIT, that's the easiest one because that patient maybe had HIT five years ago at a prior hospitalization. Um, the answer at that point is to use unfractionated heparin during cardiac surgery, but because they've had a history of HIT, you always have to be cognizant of the fact that they're at increased risk for redeveloping HIT at further exposures to heparin. So any pre- and post-op anticoagulation that's needed should be a non-heparin choice. So if they are coming in with an acute coronary syndrome, put them on argatroban or bivalirudin, whatever your usual uh, medication will be, so that they can be exposed to heparin intra-op and then post-op, again, non-heparin agents only. So even something as uh, very benign as subcutaneous heparin, these patients should not even get subcutaneous heparin because even though the incidence of them developing HIT related to that, it's still an exposure to heparin that should be avoided. The emergency surgery, this is where this becomes a little bit more interesting. Um, and by interesting, I mean stressful. Um, so if the patient has acute HIT, unfortunately, and they need emergency surgery, the um, acute or subacute HIT, so the patients still have positive antibodies, unfortunately, there is no um, role, role for heparin in these patients. They need to be managed in the operating room with alternative anticoagulants. And that is a tremendous amount of um, work that has to be done on everyone's standpoint from the surgeons to the anesthesiologists to the perfusion team because these patients have to be managed very differently in the operating room. Um, if they have a history of HIT, um, again, you can use heparin in these patients as long as your HIT antibodies are low, um, excuse me, are negative. If your ELISA is negative, there's no reason to not use heparin in these patients. But again, the pre- and post-op anticoagulation should always be a non-heparin agent. So what are the alternate um, anticoagulants that we'll use in patients with HIT if we do need to use one of those based on what we just talked about? So um, usually we're going to use one of the two direct thrombin inhibitors, so either bivalirudin or agatroban. The reason that it causes so much angst, and you'll really never see a perfusionist more stressed out, this is probably one of the two situations that they get really anxious about when we're having to use bivalirudin. Um, the reason is because of the um, pharmacodynamics of bivalirudin, if there's any areas of stasis, so any blood pooling, you know, if there's, and obviously there's going to be blood pooling because it's cardiac surgery, there's going to be blood on the field, blood in the drapes, your bivalirudin will begin to degrade, so your level of anticoagulation will often be inadequate, and you can start to thrombose the circuit and thrombose the pump, 
And if your pump is thrombosed, you automatically have to come off cardiopulmonary bypass because if we send one of those thrombi via the arterial cannula into the central circulation, you could cause a tremendous stroke, and obviously that would be a, a potentially fatal complication. So usually you'll have a couple of perfusionists there, usually, as opposed to just one that we have for standard cardiac surgery to make sure that they can, if they need to change out something like the oxygenator, if they need to change out the reservoir, they can do that as quickly as possible. But bivalirudin, despite its drawbacks, it is the most well-studied agent for use in cardiac surgery in patients who require alternate anticoagulants. And that is the one that you're going to see the most data on um, and is the one that is most validated. So that's usually going to be the agent that most of us will use. Um, we haven't had to do it a tremendous amount. Probably the patients that we see the most are the patients that you guys are taking care of in the CCU who are status one for heart transplant, has had a prior LVAD, is, or sitting here with a balloon pump, just waiting for a heart to become available, and they've had a prior history of HIT, or unfortunately they had developed HIT during this hospitalization. But you can't delay a heart transplant when the heart becomes available. We just have to go ahead and do it. So we'll usually use bivalirudin in those patients. Um, it's also concerning because you can't really monitor these patients appropriately. We'll use ACT for both bivalirudin and argatroban, but it's not really the gold standard test for measuring uh, anticoagulation with bivalirudin. There's um, the ecurin clotting time, the ECT, which is not commercially available. So we use ACT as a surrogate, but we usually are aiming for much higher ACTs. And there's some data to show that, especially at lower levels of bivalirudin, the ACT does not correlate with the level of anticoagulation that you're, use that you're needing for your procedure. Ariatroban is kind of a second line agent. We'll use that sometimes, um, especially if you have a patient with significant renal dysfunction where bivalirudin becomes very um, un undesirable, but not great. Again, it's hard to monitor those patients. We'll again use an ACT because it's very time limiting to wait for PTTs in the operating room, even with stat labs, and we can't necessarily wait 45 minutes to know if we're anticoagulated appropriately. But that's another agent that we can use. So thinking about monitoring on cardiopulmonary bypass, so back in the day, and I think there's still some groups out there that will do this, when you um, are on cardiopulmonary bypass and stable, the anesthesiologist would leave the room and go do other things. I don't really know what that's like because that's not the way we do it at Emory and I've only ever worked here, but um, people will you know, sometimes ask, you know, if they're coming from other institutions, well, what do you guys do on cardiopulmonary bypass? I'm like, well, if we continue to care for the patient. Um, so as we said, cardiopulmonary bypass is continuous flow as opposed to pulsatile flow. So what we're looking when we're monitoring the patient is we're monitoring the mean arterial pressure. So systolic and diastolic should really be the same as your, um, as your map, but everything is obviously going to be very smooth lines because there's no pulsatility. So that's something I like to tease the residents when they're coming through on their first cardiac rotation. Everything is very overwhelming for them. So I just like to look at the monitor and say, oh my God, what's going on? They're like, oh, what's happening? I'm like, no, you're fine. You're on, you're on cardiopulmonary bypass. So I like to troll them just a little bit because that's what the goal of an attending is, to be able to troll other people. Um, so you want to, other things that we're looking for. So we're looking for a reasonable map. And that's one of those areas of controversy in cardiac surgery. What is the appropriate map for, an, for a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass? The answer is honestly, even 50, 60 years later in 2019, we don't know. You know, uh, some places will say between 50 and 70. Some places will say 60 and 80. You know, a lot of it is institution dependent. Some of it is dependent on the patient. In general, we'll say if a patient has significant hypertension as part of their past medical history, especially given what their baseline blood pressures were, then we're usually going to try to maintain a higher mean on cardiopulmonary bypass because that's more likely represents what their pressures are doing around the clock um, when they're not in the hospital. But we don't know. Um, originally, when people were using cardiopulmonary bypass, they had a lot more neurologic injuries, probably because they were maintaining the means a little bit too low, um, and especially even in the post-cardiopulmonary bypass time. And the surgeons would like that because it was less bleeding. You know, if you have a lower blood pressure, your suture lines don't bleed, your chest tube output is low, you're like, wow, I'm a great surgeon. But then your patients weren't waking up quite right because they were being malperfused for a couple of days. Um, we're also looking to ensure that the heart is continuing to be decompressed, especially anytime we're doing something um, with a valvular procedure where there's going to be, you know, a lot of manipulation of the heart, or maybe they're doing multi-valve procedures, you know, they're addressing one before the other. You know, we want to make sure the heart is continued to be decompressed. We had a couple of unfortunate, um, probably distension injuries that occurred a few months ago. One was a, it was just a heart, kind of a heartbreaking case, a guy who was about my age, like in his late 30s with a bicuspid aortic valve, significant AI was coming for a primary AVR, which is probably the most well-studied, the gold standard for cardiac surgery. This is a person who should have gone home probably post-op day five, gone to his house, um, but unfortunately had a tremendous amount of LV distension. Um, not sure exactly how that wasn't recognized, but had a huge distension injury had tremendous biventricular failure trying to wean cardiopulmonary bypass, had a bunch of um, 
thrombus in his heart, so it wasn't a candidate for Avad, was transferred, um, was put on ECMO, but it was eventually transferred from here to UAB for consideration for um, total artificial heart, and I'm not sure exactly what happened with that, but that was a really devastating complication. Um, we want to both initially ensure that there has been a rest achieved when you've given your first dose of cardioplegia, and then we want to maintain continued arrest. So our first dose of cardioplegia is always going to be our highest dose. It's usually about one liter of crystalloid and blood solution with high potassium. Um, and we'll usually see an arrest within a couple of moments of starting that. But we'll, usually the perfusionist will, will remind the surgeons every 20, 30 minutes, it's been 20 minutes since your last shot, 30 minutes since your last shot. Or if we start to see some activity, if we're starting to see the atrium start to contract a little bit, or we're looking up at our EKG and it's not a smooth diastolic arrest anymore, we'll remind the surgeons, look, we see some activity, and they'll give another dose of cardioplegia. We're obviously going to be continuously monitoring the potassium during cardiopulmonary bypass, usually about every 20 to 30 minutes. And if we're starting to see the potassium become extremely high and you have a patient who has issues with normal potassium, you know, um, end-stage renal patients, CKD patients, then we can try to switch to low potassium um, regimens, um, but then you may not have as good of an arrest, so we sometimes will just have to continue to give high potassium and then manage those hyperkalemic issues when we're beginning to wean cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, we frequently assess the labs and the anticoagulation status. Um, we've had, unfortunately, a few um, massive intracardiac thrombus cases in the last few years related to some of our major aortas that we've been doing with um, Brad Leschnauer. So it has really brought a lot of light to the fact that, yes, we give a lot of um, procoagulants when we're correcting coagulopathy post-op, but we have to really think about a balanced <laughs> resuscitation. And when you're doing these extremely complex procedures where you're on cardiopulmonary bypass for four, five, six hours, which happens sometimes, you know, you're going to be incredibly antithrombin deficient, and just giving more heparin really isn't um, going to be the appropriate thing. So we're really um, much more aware now of making sure our antithrombin levels are appropriate. Because even though your ACT might be high, ACT, especially when you're hypothermic and when you are coagulopathic, is going to be a sign of overall anticoagulation and not specific just to heparin. So you have to think that even if your ACT is, you know, 800, sure, your heparin levels may be reasonable, but you're also significantly antithrombin deficient. So a couple of special techniques. Um, I think these things are really interesting and a lot of um, teaching points related to this. So just a couple of things. So. Sometimes um, we will go on cardiopulmonary bypass, but we will, we will avoid arresting the heart. So we won't put a cross clamp on the aorta, we won't give cardioplegia solution. So we call this beating heart um, surgery. So not to be confused with off-pump cabbage, but using still cardiopulmonary bypass circuit to circulate the volume, control temperature, etc., but you don't arrest the heart. Um, this is not a lot of data out there on this, to be completely honest, um, but we will sometimes use this or some of our surgeons will use this as a technique in a patient that is high risk. So maybe somebody with poor contractility, perhaps it could be somebody who um, they're concerned about maybe kidney injury, because we know that one of the complications of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and arresting the heart is post-op acute kidney injury, which has significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. So not a, not a lot of data. I would say that not a lot of our surgeons do this. One of our surgeons who isn't here anymore, but um, Duke Wynn used to do this quite a bit, um, but we don't really do that because Duke is now in Nashville. Um, so that's not really a thing that we'll do quite a bit. And especially when there's not a, a lot of data to support it, I think that one of the things I try to instill in my trainees is what does the evidence show? What's the best practice? I think in, in medicine, unfortunately, we still use a lot of anecdote. And I really try to avoid passing that along to future trainees or to current trainees and future trainees because I think that that's, that's really not a thing that we should be continuing to disseminate out there and really trying to focus on best practice in evidence-based medicine. Left heart bypass, and Dr. Jordan came in because he saw that picture and he was intrigued. Um, so left heart bypass, this is utilized in thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repairs. And so you can see this mega aorta right here. This is kind of a small picture here, but what we'll do is we'll do distal aortic perfusion to try to perfuse a lot of our major organs that we're worried about. And in, in thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair, one of the major morbidities that we can unfortunately see is um, paraplegia because we're going to be working on the aorta, we're going to be clamping the aorta where there's going to be a lot of intercostals and the artery of Adamkowicz that um, perfuse your spinal cord. So even despite best surgical technique and some of these techniques, unfortunately, it's still a known complication that can occur. So this is one of those methods that we'll do. It also provides perfusion to your lower extremities, perfusion to your um, organs below your, your cross clamp. So you can see here you've got your two clamps. Here's 
one clamp here. You can't see my mouse, sorry, but you got one clamp here and one clamp here. This is the section of aorta that we're going to be operating on, although that also looks a little bit tortuous to me. Um, but what we're doing is we're cannulating here the one of the pulmonary veins, and so as the name implies, we're bypassing the left heart. This is not full cardiopulmonary bypass. It's only partial, usually between about two and a half, maybe four liters of flow per minute at most. And obviously for a normal patient, cardiac output, we kind of benchmark between four to five liters per minute for a cardiac index of between two and 2.5. So partial cardiopulmonary bypass. So we take the blood here. It's a much smaller pump because the issue with left heart bypass is that it doesn't have a heater cooler exchanger. So you can't really regulate temperature. Um, you can't really do a lot of the other things that we're doing with full cardiopulmonary bypass. So because of that, since it's a less amount of blood flow and it's a less uh, amount of components on the bypass circuit, you require less heparinization than with standard cardiopulmonary bypass. But we go from the left, um, one of the pulmonary veins to the pump, and then we're going back, as you see here, to the distal aorta. So the, another way that you may hear this referred to as distal aortic perfusion. Those names are somewhat interchangeable. But the goal of this is, again, to try to perfuse below your cross clamp when you're doing these very high-risk procedures. Something else that we do very commonly here is selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion. This is done for acute aortic syndromes of the ascending aorta, so dissections, aneurysms very commonly. So out here is your axillary artery. The surgeons will sew a little side graft to the axillary artery. They'll open the deltoid groove right here, and then we'll flow up um, the up the arch vessels to help perfuse the brain. So for instance, you can see this ascending aorta is extremely aneurysmal, and normally we would have an aortic cannula right here in the area where the aorta is abnormal. So since we have to try to operate still in a bloodless field, but we don't want to sacrifice blood flow to the brain during that period of circulatory arrest, we'll do this to try to perfuse the brain. Um, you'll see there's a clamp here so that everything will, when we pressurize it, will only go up into the brain. So that's selective integrated cerebral perfusion if you're ever wanting to come down to see one of our aortas with um, Dr. Leschnauer. So how do we wean cardiopulmonary bypass? So it's a little bit of a dance. You know, in the beginning, when you're a fresh trainee on your first couple of cardiac anesthesia rotations, you don't really know what's going on. Your attending is kind of telling you what to do, and you're just doing what they tell you to do. But as you obviously get more experience, you'll figure out a little bit more of that dance. But um, what we're looking for is, is normal. You know, we're looking for a return to expected hemodynamic and physiologic state. So you shouldn't be expecting to see V-fib, V-tac, that's not normal, um, and a physiologic state. So if your hemoglobin's five, you want to fix that before we begin to wean cardiopulmonary bypass. If your potassium's eight, again, we're not going to be continuing to say, oh, that looks great, let's go ahead and start. No, because we're going to fail. Um, one of my, well, actually, my only motto is don't be sad at work. And really, if you think about why that's true, I mean, just set yourself up to succeed. So vascular access, you know, if you have a vascular path and your IV axis is meh, you know, put a central line in. Don't be sad at work. Because then when the patient needs emergency, let's say, um, hyperkalemia correction, and oh, they're IV infiltrated, and they're starting to have EKG changes, you're not going to be sad because you have a good EKG, uh, excuse me, a good central line. So just, I always think about that, you know, if my, if I'm concerned about something, you know, your spidey sense is tingling, your instincts are almost always right. So set yourself up to succeed, and um, don't be sad at work. But you'll hear my trainees, if they work with me a lot, they'll be repeating that too, because I say it a lot. So when we're thinking about expected hemodynamic state, so looking at a normal heart rate, so sure, 140 AFib with RVR, that's a normal, that's a heart rate, it's not a normal one. So we wanna make sure that's controlled. And again, we wanna have a stable and perfusing rhythm. So sinus rhythm is always gonna be the best if your patient has a good sinus rhythm, but if we need to pace the patient, we can A pace, V pace, AV pace, et cetera. We can start to chemically pace them with a little dobutamine if we think they'll respond to that. We're also looking for other normal hemodynamics, so normal blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, MAP. We're looking for PA pressure, CVPs, hopefully reasonably um, close to what the patient's baseline was, depending on what that is. You know, obviously, if it's a heart transplant patient, hopefully their PAs and CVPs will be significantly lower with the new heart compared to what they were pre-bypass with the old heart, but a lot of times we'll just have to individualize that and see. As we said, since we will induce uh, oftentimes systemic hypothermia, we're looking for that to be normal. We don't want to ever wean a patient off cardiopulmonary bypass who, who is systemically hypothermic because we know that's going to lead to a lot of issues with arrhythmias and coagulopathy post-op. And we're looking for normal labs. Again, if there's anything that doesn't seem right to you, then that means we have to fix that before we think about weaning cardiopulmonary bypass. 
Other things we need to look at is whatever the surgeon has done, we want to make sure that that's working appropriately. If we've done a mitral valve intervention and one of our mitral valve leaflets isn't moving, well, this is not the right time to go ahead and wean cardiopulmonary bypass because you're going to fail immediately and have to reinstate cardiopulmonary bypass. So communicating with our surgical team, you know, anytime we're doing a valve, we're looking to make sure the valve is stable, there's no significant intra or paravalvular leaks, the gradient isn't high, just something doesn't seem quite right. You know, things, every specific surgery has things that we look at, but again, thinking about a mitral valve, we worry about they may have um, snagged the circumflex coronary artery, so if there's a new lateral wall motion abnormality, we worry about that. If they're placing a bioprosthetic valve, we worry about the stent on that valve causing LVOT obstruction, so we always have to assess for that, because that has to be addressed um, usually at the time or um, we're beating to wean or else we're not gonna be successful and the patient's obviously not gonna have a good outcome. And we're also looking to see what we think if the patient's gonna need mechanical support, so something again as simple as a balloon pump or even advanced support, something like as extreme as VA ECMO. And usually when we start thinking about that is when we're on you know, a fair amount of inotropes, vasopressors, we're still having to give significant boluses, our pressure is still really low, we're still extremely vasoplegic, our contractility is poor, that's when you have to be thinking about, well, what's the next step? You know, they always will say that anesthesiologists are always thinking about plan A, B, C, and down the line. So your plan A is always going to be come off with a moderate amount of inotropic vasopressor support, have good hemodynamics, correct the coagulopathy, close the chest, move on to the next patient after you drop the patient off in the ICU. But a lot of patients didn't read that note and didn't get that memo, so they might potentially need a little bit of support. And again, we're taking care of a lot of sick patients, and I'm sure that you guys see a lot of these patients um, pre and know that they're going to struggle in the, to wean cardiopulmonary bypass. So thinking about some of the complications, um, so this sounds mean, but poor surgical repair. You know, if your surgical intervention isn't adequate, then you're not going to be able to successfully wean cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, this is honestly one thing that we deal with a lot. So poor contractility, um, so a pump problem, vasoplegia, a pipe problem, that can lead to a significant amount of difficulty weaning. Um, we have some things that we can do for that. You'll see us use methylene blue. There's some data now about B12 for va vasoplegia and cardiac surgery. Um, so lots of things that we can try to do, but sometimes despite it, you doing everything, your patient's still going to need some time, especially if you're dealing with these patients who have been on cardiopulmonary bypass for six, seven hours. Morbidity increases dramatically once you're above about, you know, 200 minutes on cardiopulmonary bypass. So we need to think about maybe these patients need a little extra time, so a couple of days of ECMO and then reassess, or maybe a couple of days with the balloon pump and reassess. Vascular injury potentially related to cannulation. So we're, anytime we're manipulating the aorta, that's one thing we always worry about. Hematoma, aortic dissection, um, that's obviously something that would be very devastating. We can fix it at the time. Um, sometimes, depending on the patient's comorbidities, we might leave it. Um, we had a patient a few months ago who had an open thoracoabdominal repair, so her descending aorta was repaired. And when we finished the case, we do a chest closed echo, and we noticed that she had a type A IMH that was probably caused from their cannula, or excuse me, their cross clamp on the descending aorta, just she had retrograde IMH. But because she was, you know, those huge morbidity mortality associated with that procedure on top of another aortic intervention, there's almost, you know, no survival for that. So lots of discussion with the surgical team. It was decided to leave it, let her recover, and then bring her back at some other time to have that addressed. Coagulopathy, that's a huge thing that we deal with in cardiac surgery. We'll use a lot of point of care testing. So at this campus, we have TAG thromboelastogram to try to give us some very detailed point of care um, data about how we can um, very um, discreetly relate, replace the appropriate clotting factors to, to restore normal coagulation. Neurologic injury, injury despite our best um, practice at you know, using safe methods on cardiopulmonary bypass. Unfortunately, these are high-risk patients. A lot of times they've had prior neurologic injury strokes, TIAs, and we know that those patients are obviously higher risk for having another neurologic injury. Post-op AFib is still a very devastating complication, and it's very, very common. I'm sure you guys are involved in a lot of post-op AFib management, even though our surgeons are used to that at this point. You know, up to 35% of cardiac surgical patients will develop post-op AFib. Sometimes it's just something that happens one or two days. Something, sometimes it's for um, the rest of their life. But it's a huge amount of um, increase in resource utilization and increase in morbidity and mortality as well. Kidney injury, another huge thing to, that we worry about. Um, so up to about 30% of patients with cardiac surgery will develop acute kidney injury, and not as many, but maybe 2 to 5% of those patients will need renal replacement therapy. But the biggest thing to think about with those patients who are requiring new renal replacement therapy who weren't on renal replacement therapy before have a 50% mortality. So it seems like something barely benign, but it's obviously really not. Um, and I think it's just a sign of how poorly they're doing overall, which is why their mortality is so increased. <clears throat> 
and infection. Unfortunately, true deep sternal wound infection, so not just a, you know just a superficial infection, but a true deep sternal wound infection where their deep parts of their fascia are infected has a uh, tremendous morbidity. I mean, it, it, usually the surgeon will quote about 50%. So if a patient with a true deep sternal wound infection has a 50% mortality, not just morbidity. So just to go over a couple of points, you know, I think um, us being able to understand all of our patient comorbidities and have a really good um, thoughts about the surgical plan and the approach, it's really vital for the cardiac anesthesiologist. These are one of the the specialties where if we're not really heavily involved in what the surgeon's doing, the patient's gonna have a bad outcome. So we have to have a tremendous amount of understanding of the anatomy and all the patient issues. We rely on a really thorough workup from y'all. So you know, this is a really um, thank you to you guys for doing all the, the stuff that you're doing in the background to try to help us make sure that we have all the data, all of the questions have been answered before the patients come to the operating room. And you're gonna be continuing to collaborate with us and I know that's been a really good um, relationship on our end um, as CT surgery is really evolving. As I said, you know, looking back to 2007, TAVR was this brand new thing and now it's you know, very much done out there in community hospitals that do 50 hearts a year. So it's gonna be increased um, collaboration as the field continues to evolve. I think we have just a couple of minutes for questions if there are any. All right, um, if you do have any questions, feel free to email me, reach out. I know I see a lot of you guys roaming around, but I'd be happy to talk to you and thanks for your time. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.